Washington is Daniel Levy. He is the president of the U.S. Middle East Project. Uh, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me, Linda. So you were a former member of the Israeli delegation to the Israeli-Palestinian peace talks. And despite all those, those efforts, those years of discussions, it seems that peace is more elusive than ever. What is your take on what we are seeing right now? Well, I really appreciate you reminding me and your audience that there is such a thing as peace talks, or at least there was, because, you know, we've just seen that report. We've seen the images coming out of Gaza. We've seen what happened to Israelis on October 7th. And you had a very moving interview with with an Israeli woman who was saying, take all the children out of this conflict, release children being held prisoner by Israel, and of course, those being held in Gaza, and I think it's just important sometimes to, to do that, to step back, you know, take off our, our, okay, the military are gonna do this, what will they do next hats, and just remember that war is horrific and everything should be done to stop this now. I know that America is, and, and it's been reported, claiming some credit that, you know, the ground invasion hasn't happened yet. This hasn't spread into a broader regional escalation yet. But neither of those things are guaranteed to continue. In fact, they're almost guaranteed to get worse. And you're right to say that if we have a ground invasion, and what's happening without a ground invasion is horrific enough, 1,600 dead Palestinian children in Gaza, more than the entire child death toll, as horrible as that phrase is, in Ukraine in the first year. But if there is that ground invasion, gets worse. There was an Israeli attack in the West Bank in Janine last night then the likelihood of a spillover, a broader conflagration increases. So I think you have to look at this and say, wait a minute, there's the humanitarian need. We had a, a trickle, just a touch of something yesterday. There was the release of the two Americans. Maybe we can get a dynamic where the prisoner release becomes more to the forefront. And we need to get into a de-escalation de and an immediate ceasefire. And I know people might say, ah, oh, that's not realistic. But I'll tell you what's not realistic. What's not realistic is to think after years and decades that if you militarily crush the Palestinians and keep them without rights, without hope, stateless, every day, even before October 7th, subjected to a horrific occupation and dispossession, that somehow that will bring security to Israelis and Palestinians. So my plea is step back from the brink and, and now we can talk policy, but I think it's so important to remember those things. It really is. You make so many great points there. <clears throat> I've spoken with uh, Israeli Defense Forces spokespeople, and I've asked them and challenged them on that notion of their objective to destroy Hamas, to take out that entire terror network, and the risk that in, in trying to do that, uh, you, you, there's some other, the radical terrorists emerges, some other group emerges. What is the, what sort of objective should there be on all sides right now to minimize the risk of escalation? Well, look, those, those spokespeople are doing their job. They're given their talking points. Uh, the talking points are, are what they are. The political and military leadership, <clears throat> I think is, I think it look, it, it's looking for revenge. It thinks perhaps that if you target this and target that and target the other, and I get, by the way, it's their job to provide security to Israelis. I think they conspicuously failed to do that, not only in the immediate lead up to October 7th, but in the <clears throat> years and decades in which they avoided doing politics. The military can give respite to politicians to pursue other means. That's what the military will almost always tell you. And if you want to do counterinsurgency, if you want to try and isolate militants, you don't turn the whole population against you. So by keeping Palestinians in these conditions, whether it's in Gaza under a siege for 16, 17 years, already a population of refugees kicked out during what the Palestinians call the Nakba, the catastrophe, if it's in the West Bank, wherever it is, what you're doing is you're encouraging rather than diluting militancy amongst the population. So they are now set, I would argue, with an impossible task of win this 
militarily. And I think it's the job, because Israel is, is feeling pain, I get that, after October 7th. It was a horrendous thing. But the job, I think, of the outside, and this is why, yes, the US administration has been in there, and I hope that they keep working those channels more intently, but it's the job of the outside to walk them back. They're doing some of that. I don't think they're doing enough of that. Maybe the supply of weapons they think gives them more purchase on the Israeli decision making, but it doesn't feel that way. And I think to the rest of the world, this looks like warmongering and it looks like a double standard. And the King of Jordan spoke at a peace summit in Cairo yesterday, and he's an American ally, kind of dependent on America. He's someone taken seriously in Israel as well. And he made that plea. He said when a country was doing the kind of things Israel is doing somewhere else, and he was, of course, referring to the Russia-Ukraine situation, they were held accountable unequivocally. And he was saying the rest of the world is looking at this and seeing that you hold people of a certain race, religion, in a certain part of the world differently. Their lives are worth less. And I think there's a cost to America here, not only in what's directly happening, but also in the broader image, in vetoing a very modest a call for a humanitarian pause at the United Nations. So I think there are so many reasons why America should help Israel step back from an unrealizable goal that its soldiers will pursue with determination, but it can't succeed because there is no military solution. And the hell that the people of Gaza, the Palestinian 2.2 million who live there are going through, and 20 trucks doesn't even begin to shift that hell needs to be brought to an end because it does not bring a better tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. Those, those 20 trucks uh, carrying aid represent just 3% <clears throat> of what they normally get every single day. Daniel Levy, we'll have to leave it there for now, but really good to have you on the program. Thanks so much. Thank you.